First things first, John, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm doing well. Um, so there's a lot to talk about uh, with the dead daisies, but I want to get into the couple of years that that uh, that were before you rejoined the band. Now, I read somewhere in a, a different interview, you said it was almost like feeling feeling like three years of doing nothing. How did you get through that time musically? Well, I, obviously with COVID, you know that nobody was really doing much of anything sure. in the industry. So, um, obviously, I was panicked like everybody else. And um, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in Australia, Paul Miles, and he asked, uh, you know, he had been, he had been discussing with me about possibility of writing a book, um, which we did do. Uh, we finished the book. It's been out now for about a year. Uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. So, um, let me see where you go. Okay. And um, so we finished that. And then obviously because it was, I mean, I, I couldn't do anything like recording in the studio, nothing. So I took Pro Tools classes to learn how to record myself. Got everything I needed, set it up a little, I set up a little studio in my house. And, um, you know, so I've been, you know, I'm still a little new to it, still figuring it out every day. But uh, I've been recording new music and um, just ideas and stuff like that. So I kind of kept busy, you know, and then I, I was just out doing shows uh, when I could. So I, I kind of kept busy, but it wasn't, you know, it still was weird to not be working steady as usual sure because it's been such a big part of your life for so long as well uh, but delving into pro tools i find that interesting is there anything you discovered about your voice or, or how you use your voice in in kind of uh, approaching it more from from that productional uh perspective no not really i mean it was just it was just kind of liberating um you know, to come up with an idea and just go into my room and start playing around with it and recording these things. I know, like I said, I, I don't know much, you know, obviously I've, I've been working with uh, Marty Fredrickson who produced a couple of the dead daisies records. Marty and I are friends. So uh, what I do is I'll record an idea and then I give it to him. Uh, to help me finish and make it sound like a polished, you know, pro yeah. th final product. But, um, you know, there's things that I, it'll take me like a couple of days to do where that it's, you know, Marty could do in like 20 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm still a little caveman with it, but you know, it's just really liberating knowing that I can just take an idea and start recording it, play around with it, edit, you know, do some of the things I want to do, um, you know, and just kind of, and, and just kind of do it myself. I, I, I like that thing of being able to do something myself. Yeah, there's a so, lot of freedom in that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the autobiography as well. It's always interesting when you do an autobiography, there's a lot of reflecting on on things in the past. I don't want to linger on this subject too long, but is there one thing that really st struck struck you as you went through kind of your musical life or even your personal life? It, yeah, you know, to to be honest with you, which is another reason why we used the title that we did. Um, I after reading my book, I kind of realized that. You know, yes, I am very blessed um, to be able to, to, I mean, in all honesty, there's not many people can sit there and say that they've been um, uh, 
able to do something and, you know, to be quite honest, you know, be able to make a good living doing something they want to do or they like to do for 35 years, 40 years, 45 years. Uh, I mean, I've always played music and somehow managed to make a living at it. The funny thing of it is, though, the thing that I did realize when I was doing this book is that I'm the king of always being at the right place, but always at the wrong time. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like some opportunities that I've had, you know, like the Scream, Motley, Union, um, all great bands. Um, I think we came up with a great records but for some reason it was like oh god you know the grunge era or the you know what i mean so it was just like always always doing something i'm always doing something really cool but it's always at the wrong time or there's some some little catastrophe that happens outside of my control that Mm -hmm. just puts a glitch in the program but uh, it is what it is, man. I'm just very grateful to be here. I've played with some amazing musicians throughout my career. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, I think if anybody just looks at my body, like the entire body of work, I I, I, I sat there and I thought about it. And even talking with my manager, my wife, my wife, and just a few close friends, they're like, dude, you know, your body of work is pretty consistently. It's like you've not really done anything that's just a stinker. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I guess I'm blessed that way. No, no, I was going to save this maybe for later, but one of my favorite things that you've done is the Unplugged album in 2012. And uh, is is that a similar, because I can I feel like it's a similar story where kind of those Unplugged albums uh, at that time, 2012, around there, weren't that popular, but the music is really good. The guitar playing is great. Your voice is great. How do you look back at that album in particular? Well, and, and again, you know, it, it's funny, like the last couple records that I've done, my live album, the uh, unplugged record, you know, n- now it's like sitting here and, it, it, you know, you sit and you look at record sales and it's not that good for anybody. Mm. So everybody now is trying to figure out the streaming thing. Right. So <laughs> once again, I released this record. Everybody goes, oh, my God, dude, what a great acoustic record i was just talking um uh to russ from the killer dwarves uh the band the killer dwarves in canada uh like a week ago mm-hmm. and he, that Aaron, he said the same thing he goes dude i don't i don't know how he said i listen to your acoustic record every morning with my wife we take our dog for a walk and we listen to that record top to bottom we don't skip any songs it's such a great record. How how that didn't make you a household name, I I, right. I, I don't. But again, it's like I did this record. Uh, we recorded it at my house, and then mixed it in Atlanta. Uh, and but it, it, it's the age of streaming now, so it, you know what I mean. It's like once again, I did. I'm like I arrived to the party but late <laughs> you know what i mean whatever but you, you mentioned something interesting which is kind of that that when you when you started playing music it was obviously a different time uh the business wasn't as professional as it is now it wasn't uh, so much focused on on well obviously social media wasn't around but it, it has definitely changed but one thing i find interesting about uh yourself and i think that that daisies as well you managed to um maintain that that original rock and roll feel if that makes sense Uh, what do you attribute that to and you mentioned the word consistency earlier as well with the dead days even though it's a revolving door in a way you've been very consistent with the output both in quality and 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 number of albums well first of all 
you know, I, I think at the end of the day, like, we're all inspired by and huge fans of, you know, the music of, like, if you, let's be real. If you look at all of our ages, we all grew up in that time frame. Like, I, I've always stated, I think the greatest 15 years of music has been from when the Beatles did the record Rubber Soul. So, what was that? 60, 1965, 66. Sure. To about 1980. I think once 1980, the whole MTV thing came in, it was a great time for music, but it, it, I think it became very corporate and it became very, really cookie cutter. Sure. Uh, where the stuff that we grew up listening to, you know, your bands like, uh, you know, you had Sabbath, you had Zeppelin, you had Jeff Rhodes Hall, you had Queen, you had David Bowie, Alice Cooper, Grand Funk Railroad, Aerosmith, uh, the Beatles, Janis Joplin. The you know, it was so yeah. eclectic. Yes, um, you know, like so, just the music scene in general. It wasn't unusual for a kid when I was a kid. You would go see Black Sabbath on Wednesday, and then you'd go see Jim Croce on Saturday, or you know what I mean, uh, Seals and Crops. Right. We all grew up in that time frame of music, and that's what we draw from. So, I think consistently, you, all five of us are friends. We're all the same age, even though David Lowy's favorite band may be ACDC and mine might be Led Zeppelin it's still from that same that same era or same pot of music so we just kind of throw things in and it just somehow works yeah and is, is that creative process is that tricky when when there are uh, people moving in and out uh, of the band or, or... well it, let, let's you know there, there there's <sighs> There's one factor. I did an interview yesterday, and the, and the, I guess they had counted the names that are, have been associated with mm. the Dead Daisies. And, you know, it's a misleading number. Yes, it's a collective. David set it up so that it's just an easy situation where, you know, if John Karabi or this guy can't, can't make a show, uh, no worries, man. We'll just get this guy to come in. Yeah. But a lot the a lot of the names that are on this list are just friends of ours uh who for one reason or another had to fill in for somebody in the band marco couldn't do some shows so we got daryl from you know the the rolling stones to come in and play bass um you know uh there was a, a, a time right before we were getting ready to go to australia Richard Ford has had a motorcycle accident. Oh. So we got a, a buddy, uh, Dave Leslie from the bed, ba uh, you know, baby animals or uh, yeah, baby animals or whatever to come in and play guitar for us. Damon Johnson, another one, David Lowe, couldn't do a couple shows. So Damon Johnson came in or Yogi came in, uh, like, uh, Dino uh, came mm -hmm. in and sang and, um, so they're, you know, we say that they're part of the family or part of the whatever, but it's like, really, there's kind of been a core band. Okay. Uh, you know, initially it was uh, David Lowy, uh, John Stevens, the original singer, Richard right. Ford, Eddie Reed, and Marco. And, and uh, I think... Um, Initially, I don't, I can't remember who they had on drums, but then they finally settled in on Brian Tishy. So they had a, they had a core thing there. John had, uh, I don't know what his deal was, but he couldn't do some. He, he, he was having some issues or whatever. So he, uh, I came in, and then that band was there. But then Richard and Dizzy had to go do Guns and Roses. So there's still <laughs> been a kind of a core band. Um, you know, um, 
and, and like I said, all the other names have been uh, just just friends that came in and helped out and helped us get through a tour. So, um, well, you know, oh, I'm ahead, sorry. sorry. No, I'm just rambling now. It's a <laughs> bunch of no, useless. But- <laughs> no, it is interesting to hear the perspective because yeah, you never know what what the intricacies uh, are. But with, uh, with what you mentioned, then uh, what does that say about the community of musicians within that rock and roll scene or uh, in, in, within that that space that you operate? Because everybody seems to be friendly and seems to be wanting to play with each other. Yeah, but you know what? I, I think that's always been there. Okay. If the um... You know, uh, just for example, I mean, I mean, if you remember the original Woodstock Festival and that whole community, like right. all these different cats were hanging out backstage and they were hanging out with each other. And, you know, and and it was funny when I did the Scream record, we found this lady that had a recording studio or her husband had a recording studio back in the 60s and 70s, actually more in the 60s. And uh, Eddie Kramer produced our record, and he, this this woman, her husband had passed away, and he had a treasure trove of these tapes from, like, Hate Asbury Recording Studio, and it was, dude, it was the craziest shit you'd ever, it was like, you know, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, smoking weed with Jimi Hendrix and and like some of the Grateful Dead guys and you know whatever and just doing these impromptu jams and hanging out with each other and talking politics and the Vietnam War and just jamming and it was all on tape uh the banter and and the, and the the stuff they were doing so there's always been like yeah there's some look there's always one asshole at every party <laughs> But for the most part, I think most musicians, you know, tend to try to be cool to each other. And mm. you know, look, look, we're all land gypsies. We're all land pirates. And, you know, we're not doing anything. We're not creating a, a cure for cancer. We're not solving world hunger. We just play an A chord and put a melody on it, you know, and we're having fun. So I think that there's, uh, you know... I, I think for the most part, most musicians, uh, you know, they tend to flock together anyway. So it's all good. Yeah. The way you were talking, it reminded me of um, a documentary called the festival express where they took a train, I think through Canada. It was uh, with, with the people from the band and uh, Janis Joplin was there. Um, all kinds of people just, just sitting in, in a train car drinking and making music together. <laughs> Yeah, and they would literally make these random stops in some bum fuck little town. Right. Load up on more booze <laughs> back on the train. And I can't remember what it was called, but I saw that documentary and I thought it was fucking brilliant. It was awesome. Yeah, it was really cool to see that camaraderie as you as you talk about. And and it's good to hear that it, that's more more prevalent than than we might perceive uh, at at points. Let's jump into some of the history of the Dead Daisies then, because uh, you're bringing out a best of album. Uh, mm-hmm. Is there? I counted uh, where the songs all, from which albums all of the songs came. Uh, is there one era or one album that sticks out to you? Because if we go through the songs, uh, Revolution is is the one where where most songs come from. The, the, it's the only album with four songs on the best song. Um. Well, you know what? It's it's weird though because I, I I've said this before. I don't know what happened when we did that record. Um, You know, I'd like to sit here and go, well, it was all because I joined the band and blah, blah, (laughs) blah. There was some, I don't know what happened with that record. We did that album. um, And obviously Midnight Moses, we put that out, which you know is a cover song by Alex Harvey. Um, There was something magical with that record. We the minute we put that record out, we immediately started getting a lot of press, a lot of attention. We immediately went out on the road with Kiss and we did a huge tour with Kiss. And 
came home and then went right back out again with White Snake. And we, you know, so we were playing into, you know, in front of huge crowds. We did Download Festival. Uh, we did a bunch of great festivals that year. And somehow, or for some weird, you know, universal cosmic reason, Midnight Moses uh, just caught on with everybody. Mm. Mexico caught on with everybody. Something I said caught on with everybody. And then you have to remember, too, uh, you know, that was the year that that whole Bataclan incident happened. Mm. And right. so I think even songs like You and I just really resonated with people. Mm. And it's just been like, you know, this kind of steady upward trend since. So, um, you know, that one, I think that record just kind of slapped everybody in the face and, you know, so, I, and, and it was a lot of fun doing it. It was a lot of, it was, there was a lot of fun touring. Um, you know, I know obviously Dizzy and, and Richard left for Guns N' Roses, mm -hmm. but we had a lot of fun doing that tour, uh, a lot of fun recording the record. Um, and it happened, it just happened. It was, it's the weirdest thing. Like that's one of the coolest things about this band. When I first joined, I remember talking to our manager, David, uh, this guy, gentleman, David Edwards. And he said, uh, okay, lads, you know, you're in the studio in Australia and, uh, we're going to do a record and, uh, we got a month. And I was like, wait, we, we have a month to write, record, mix, master, artwork. And he goes, yep. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, what the fuck? Like, how, how can, but then it was weird. Like, I, like, the, like, it was so weird. Like, the next day I saw this documentary on Netflix uh, it was called the making of it's the, it, those classic records. They find a sure. classic record and they did the making of deep purple machine head. Okay. And all the setbacks they had in that record, it wound up being one of their biggest albums ever. And they recorded that record in three weeks. I go, okay, if they can do that, eight songs in three weeks, then we can do 10 songs or 12 songs in a month. We, we got this. <laughs> and yes. And it was just this magical little thing. And then all of a sudden it took off. So it was, it was, uh, it was awesome. <laughs> that whole thing, man, it was awesome. Yeah. But I, I believe even, even you and the band, uh, you guys were, were a bit surprised of to what level it took off. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and it was weird. Like, I remember my wife came out and saw us in Paris and she was like, just looking around at one of the kiss shows. And, and she was like, Holy crap, this is insane. Like the download festival was insane. And just the press we were getting. And she was just sitting there going, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. Like, you know, they, like it, it's happening. Mm. Uh, so uh you know it like i said it was just like this magical unexplainable you know uh thing that just happened it just took off when we did that record and you know it's growing um it's it's still growing and still going forward so you know what dude like i said earlier in the conversation we're all just blessed man we're just whatever a bunch of land pirates <laughs> But it's great to have that perspective because then you I, I, you can really start to enjoy it, I suppose. When, when when it's just that carrot in front of you with success and then kind of wanting to uh, accomplish certain things, I, I think you, you can lo uh, lose sight a little bit of, of what's going well, on. You know, and, and, it, and it's weird without without sit without sounding negative or positive or whatever. I think, you know, 
especially with me, with everything that I've been through, again, like right. always wrong place, but the you know, right place, but the wrong time and yada, yada. You know, now there's the streaming and, and social media and it, that was it's completely different from when I started. I just I just kind of go into everything and say, all right, I need to do I, I need to do the best that I can do writing, singing. Uh, getting on stage, giving the audience the best. And then I just go, you know, <laughs> chips fall where they may. I, 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 I like what I, I used to term that I'm pessimistically optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's get into a, a, a couple of the songs uh, more specifically before I let you go. Is, is there one song? Out of the, all of the things that you've done with that daisies, that that sticks out to you perhaps a little bit more than the rest, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one that ended up on the best uh, best of album, but just one song that really kind of sticks out to you if you, if you quickly glance back at all of the music that you've made. Um, you know, again, that's like picking your favorite finger. <laughs> sure, sure. All the mine lately has been this one, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me rephrase it then. Is is there a certain contribution you made at any point uh, that that you're particularly proud of? Maybe just just a simple vocal line, or just the, how your voice sounded. Just just something that you can pinpoint. Well, that was, I, I thought that was quite special. Um, wow, that's a good question. I I you know what song I really. You know, there, there's certain ones that we've done on the, each record. Um, I think on the Revolution record, I really love the song, which they had started working on prior to me being there, was I, I love the song Something I Said. Because hmm. for some reason, that song, it, it's like, it's like bluesy, it's almost got an R and B vibe to it in the choruses, sure. and then it gets really heavy, and then it comes back down. It's got all these little moods in it, and I think vocally, uh, I, I I love the way my voice came across on on that track, um, on the make some noise record. Uh, there's a song on the Make Some Noise record. I don't know why I like it so much, but I just, from a lyric point of view, I love the song We All Fall Down. Mm. Because it's... I don't know if it explains it, but it basically is talking about karma like like people doing something that they know they shouldn't do but they do it anyway and the you know uh, consequences i guess would be the word it's a song about consequences right and, uh, i so i really thought lyrically even though it's a little vague or not vague it's uh i, I don't know what the word is i'm looking for right Cryptic. now what Crypt cryptic maybe it's it's a little weird because at one point i'm talking about a one-eyed jack and <laughs> you know it sounds like i'm talking about cards which i may be but the way i described it it's kind of this colorful little way about talking about consequences um and then on uh the burn it down record um I loved uh, I loved the song "Burn It Down." Uh, I thought "Rise Up" was just a great uh, statement uh, mm. in to the world of politics without really taking one side or the other. It's just like open your eyes, like this is what's going on. Uh, you know, I loved "Rise Up," but I also loved. Uh, um set me free i mm. thought that set me free was beautiful so um i you know 
it, it's it, it, like each record there's there, there's one or two little gems on it that i i kind of find myself playing more than the others but uh that would be the ones for me sure and you, you have a certain perspective i'm sure there's memories uh, attached to certain songs uh being in the studio or whatever was going on at that time so it's a uh, it's an interesting way how, how certain songs stick with you yeah it's weird because you know uh I mean, even like the Scream record, I could tell you probably one of my, you know, even that, it's probably Father, Mother, Son sure. from this. Then a lot of fans ask me, like, you know, what's my favorite Motley song? Well, and I honestly, <clears throat> I, I, I would have to hands down immediately say misunderstood because okay. There were so many intricate parts of that song, the orchestra, like all the stuff. And I just remember being in a room with the guys and sitting with an orchestra conductor saying, no, like not necessarily knowing how to give him a chart, but we were humming to him what we wanted to hear. And he mm. was made, you know, so that song just really showed four guys like working as a unit together and making this epic grandiose song. You know what I mean? So it was, I, there's always like one with each record. You know what I mean? I have a question. I don't know if it's a good one, but you described this process with Motley and uh, I don't want to get into the drama of what, what the band is going through now because they are going through some stuff. But from your perspective, because you've played with so many different people and in so many bands, what 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 is conducive to the situation where four guys can work together and make good music, and why doesn't it work out other times? You think respect? Okay. I I mean it, it, it's it's that way with anything. You know, the guys used to laugh at me because I would always precursor an idea uh or if i didn't like something i i you know i would always precursor my statement with hey i, I i'm not trying to be an asshole here but mm. so they used to get mad at me and they go dude just say what the fuck you're talking about like just spit it out and i'm like no, I, I, I'm not the type of person to just go, no, I don't like that. There's, you, you know what I mean? Sure. And I've been told and taught you attract a lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So I, I always try to respect the other person. I don't want to step on their toes. Um, you know what I mean? And it's like, I may not agree with an idea, but I'll at least try it. So mm. it's it, to me, these fucking bands, a lot of them, like uh, somebody usually becomes a little full of themselves and feels like, you know, all the fans are there to see them. Mm. And I still need to remind some people, you know, and and I don't mean this as a slag, but Ringo Starr had a lot of fans too. Do you know what I'm oh, saying? Yeah. It, it's like you, you know, you can sit here and talk about the ir or not irrelevant, the guy that people think is not that important, and I'll make an argument that guys like 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 Ringo Starr or. Another one, Led Zeppelin would not sound like Led Zeppelin if it wasn't for John Bonham. Certainly. Yeah, so it's like you just got to respect what each person in the band does. Work, you know, work it and 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 just be polite, just be respectful of A, their feelings and B, their creative ideas. Try them. And then, you know, I think most people, even even a bad idea will stink up the room. And I think the person that even came up with the idea will go, oh, OK, maybe that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> right. You know, so it, it's just it's a risk to me. It's just respect. Um, and I don't want to dwell on the Motley thing. None of this drama surprises me at all. Mm. Because, 
you know, that, whatever. That's been drama for as long as I can remember. But for music fans, whenever you hear these stories, and, and for instance, with what happened with Pink Floyd and all that kind of stuff, it, 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 as fans of music, it's, it really is a shame in a way that, that these these very creative enterprises, but that, that's the question that maybe they, they need, that was, it was inevitable that the creative juices came from that friction or something, but I don't know. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, but that's the thing again, like, one member or two members will be, start to think that shit doesn't stink. Right. And, and that they're the reason everybody's there to see the band. And I could sit here and go, yeah, Roger Waters, great fucking songwriter. You know, David Gilmer's a great songwriter too. And, you know, uh, Roger Waters may have been the main songwriter, but you know, if it wasn't for the other four guys playing sure. sounds, those songs wouldn't have sounded the way they sounded. So it was a cohesive, you know, and yeah. again, I don't know if it's Gilmore. I don't care <laughs> I, if, if, if it's Gilmore being the asshole or if it's Roger Waters being the asshole. It's like, whatever, you know, it, it's it, it is what it is. Yeah. But it is, and there's it's always somebody thinking that their shit doesn't stink. I'm the reason why everybody's here to see the band, and you know, and so the other three guys can fuck off. And right. it's like now you're gonna start having now you're gonna start having the problems. Yeah. Um, one final question. I, th I think uh, I've got two minutes left on the timer. I see here. So, so very quickly, uh, very luckily, within the dead days, is none of that is going on. So, are you guys uh, thinking about writing new songs already, or have you written new songs already? Yeah, but in, again, in all honesty. Oh, and by the way, I'll give you four minutes. Um, I'll say it as quickly as I can. Um, right now, the main focus is the new record. We're promoting the new record and we're just trying to put a, a cool kick-ass set together that encapsulates all of the music that the Dead Daisies have done. Uh, right now, we're still blowing the dust off of songs that I haven't played in three, four, five years, but they haven't played either because Glenn only did the ones that he was comfortable with. So sure. a lot of shit that they hadn't played at all either. So Right now, it's just like, let's focus on today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. Um, you know, we have talked about, you know, doing more more music and, and starting a writing process, but we haven't set a date and said, okay, here's when we're going to do a record. You know what I mean? But so, so, I feel confident something's coming. That's, that's, uh, that's very good to hear. Uh, John, may I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me? Awesome, buddy. Thank you.